Yo, all right. We're all, it's an honor to be with you. I need to close the door. And we'll get started. All right. All right. All right. Well, God bless you. Thank you so very much for uh, being with us and taking time out of your uh, very busy schedule to uh, uh, spend a, a little time with us. And I, I cannot uh, express uh, how uh, appreciative we are All that right. you do something All like right. this. Well, God bless you. Thank it's you my pleasure. Much. I was so honored that you asked me to come. I, I, I want to be sure that I, I uh, comb my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me tell you, let me be the first to tell you, you look good. You look good. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, I, you, you, you remember that story you told about, uh, about the parrot in the, in the, uh, yes, <laughs> so yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, um, woman that came into the store and, and, and the parrot said, uh, uh, boy, you are, are, are ugly. <laughs> and, uh, it's like, uh, uh, she was upset by it, but, you know, after all, it was a parrot with a parrot brain. And uh, uh, she walked around the back, and uh, 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 he, the parrot turned around, looked at her again, and said, boy, you are ugly. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I'm starting to take this personally. Yeah. And uh, uh, she went to the store manager and said, uh, how dare you have a bird call people ugly when they come into the store? And the manager said, we've never had that problem before. I don't. I don't know what's going on, and uh, uh, but he went over and he talked to the parrot. He told the parrot, you can't call people ugly when they come in here. You do this, you'll never leave the store, and we'll put you in the back. And uh, I don't know how, but the parrot seemed to understand until she was walking out the store, and the parrot looked at her and said, you know what you are. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I hope you don't have any parrots in the room yeah. here today. <laughs> I, I would like to just start with prayer, and then we'll ask you just a couple conversational questions, and then we'll introduce you to say whatever word of the Lord that you have, and uh, then we'll make some closing announcements and uh, ask if you would to do a closing prayer. But thank you uh, for being one of our uh, special guests during this 40th anniversary. Uh, Father, in your name, I thank you for this time together, and I pray right now, Lord, that you would uh, bless our conversation, send your word, your unction, and your anointing. Bless all those who are viewing or listening. Lord, God, let your power prevail on their behalf, and after this time together, help them to say it was good for us to have been there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, not sure what happened, but okay, there you're back. All right. Uh, yeah. But... Um, wanted to start out by acknowledging that both you and I were blessed to have uh, great fathers in the uh, gospel, great uh, uh, preachers and, and pastors and leaders uh, uh, and from your family and from ours. Your, your whole family is doing great works and uh, continue uh, to this day. But your father, your, your sainted father, who's uh, uh, gone on to his uh, reward just uh, a short while ago, at least in my memory, it seems like a short while ago, uh, was a great national evangelist, a uh, uh, great uh, man of God who helped launch a number of other people's national evangelistic uh, uh, ministries. Uh, uh, and I, I was blessed. My father was a national evangelist as well. I'm not sure he was on your dad's level, but uh, he definitely preached all over. Uh, and uh, it's just different growing up in the pastor's house. Uh, there, there are certain things that you have to deal with that uh, people who are not uh, 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 children of pastors have to deal with. They say that uh, the uh, uh, pastor's children are the worst children in the church. Uh, but I always say if, they, if, if the pastor's kids are the worst kids, it's because we learned everything from the deacon's kids. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they taught us everything we know. Uh -huh. um, and I know growing up in my dad's church, um, we were not allowed to miss service. I mean, you had to almost be dead to, to yeah. miss service. Uh, I remember telling my father I had to do some homework, and he told me to do the homework at church. Right. Uh, you tell her, I remember telling him I was sick. He said, come to church and get healed. Yeah. You know, I, this, yeah. Everything was going to be at church. And we were almost at church every night of the week. 
how did your experience as a pastor's kid growing up affect the outcome of your life good or bad yeah and speak I, as I much think, or as little as you would like well you know and i appreciate uh, let me say this this opportunity to share with you and congratulations to you on on 40 years i that's that's uh tremendous tremendous that someone would uh spend 40 years at the same uh same profession and uh especially in this uh, uh i guess a uh, advocation and vocation that uh, most on the average most don't last uh, over five years so what a what an honor it is and I'm, I'm happy to be associated with you my my father your father were were, were dear friends they were and uh yeah so i appreciate this opportunity that we can connect on this generational level and uh, i consider you a friend. i tell people i don't i don't have a lot of friends and um of course i'm not looking for <laughs> not looking for a whole lot of friends sometimes friends get in the way but uh just a few people that uh, i do have a, a real bond with and i i thank you uh that i, I consider you a friend of mine as, as, uh, as, yeah so do i thank yeah. you and, and and growing up as you said in the in the household of a, of a pastor i i tell people I tell our church now they they can finish it for me. I tell our church that I grew up in what was called a saved home. You remember we we had saved home. Yeah. And my definition of a saved home is where everything is a sin. That <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a saved home. Uh, couldn't do anything without uh, you know being accused of or being careful that you don't you know the Lord's not going to come in and strike you dead. <laughs> um, but uh, and it was it was um, trying. Uh, because you, you would see other people having fun and you couldn't have fun. You, right. you, you hear that story about, I, I was listening as you were saying, we had to be there. Uh, that's what I heard the story. Someone said they had a drug problem. Right. Uh, that, uh, you know, their parents drug them to church every time they had something going on. And so I resented that uh, at a certain point in my life. I had resentment that uh, I had to go to church. And, and almost, you know, sometimes it, it, my friends would go on other to games and, and uh, things like that, and they go, "You going to the game? Going to the party?" I said, "No, no, man, I, I don't want to go." I, <laughs> you know, act, act like you don't want to go. It's like the rocks and the grapes, you know. That yeah, I don't want those grapes. That they probably sour anyway. So uh, I, I made excuses for for living uh, the life that the Lord wanted me to live for a long time. And thank God for my parents because I look now at some of the people who um, you know I came up with that uh didn't didn't make it uh i have a, a friend we we were in the choir together we were in sunday school we went to vacation bible school we you know we we fought we 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 uh i almost made a mistake we borrowed uh apples from the neighbor <laughs> <trees>. uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> we did those things he's now uh, in and i think uh i've been pastoring here or th I'm going on 38 years now. Congratulations. Uh, he is on his 37th year in prison. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. So he didn't have the restrictions that I had. And uh, so in retrospect, it, it was good for me uh, to have grown up in that, uh, that kind of environment. Who knows what my life would have been like if I had not uh, had those parameters placed uh, uh, upon me. Now, I also don't think all that was necessary um but you know that's where we were and I, i'm i'm glad for the discipline that i learned uh, growing up because I, I believe in every era there's a relax if you look at at the history there's a relaxation of standards and you just think about it uh dr cummings if, if if our environment growing up had been what today's environment is right what would today be like wow you know? That's one powerful. of the frightening things to me is that one of these days, these days are going to be referred to as the good old days. Wow. That's scary. That is. Um, so I, I didn't want to be a preacher. Um, didn't want to be a pastor. I thought if I accidentally do preach, I won't be pastoring. And of course, you know, God had another plan. And I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad that, that the Lord led my led me in the path that he that he did. I'm, I'm happy now that I'm where I am. Wow, you know, I, I had that same testimony. I I promised myself that I would never be a minister, and if I was a minister, I'd never be a pastor. And yeah. I just learned that uh, uh, God loves it when you tell Him what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah. Me and Jonah have learned that uh, yeah, yeah. don't tell them what you're not going to do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> As That's a joke right. to him. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, the, uh, for somebody who may be watching, who is considering the uh, uh, pastor, considering a minister, or considering just a missionary, not just, but considering being a missionary or some work for the Lord, Sunday school teacher, what, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, what was your call to the ministry? How, how did you know that? since you had already proclaimed that this, what, this did, you didn't want to do it, what happened that, that made you understand this is what I've got to do? Uh, you know, that's interesting because I never, I, you know, I'd hear people talk about their calling to the ministry right. and some heard a voice and some saw a vision and some had right. a dream. And I didn't ask people how you know when you're called into the ministry because I didn't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to be able to say, I, well, I didn't know that. Before, I didn't know. So I didn't ask anyone, you know, well, how do you know when you're called? But with me, it was a sense of urgency. Mm. Um, I remember very well, um, I was, I think when it really, it, it became a burden. Um, I remember I was, actually, I had gotten married. Um, I was, uh, I think, two, almost three years into my marriage. And I had decided that it was necessary for me to, go back to school. And so I went back to work on my master's degree. I was living in Bluefield at the time, member of the church my father was pastoring and, and uh, I had no idea that if we fast forward, I'd be pastoring here in Huntington at that point. Wow. But I, I went to Marshall, I would drive on, on during the week in the summer and come to Marshall for classes at, in Huntington. And I stayed with my grandfather who actually, I succeeded him as pastor of this church. I had no idea that that would happen, obviously. But anyway, I stayed with him, and I, I went to school there. And, and on my passage back and forth, it was about a three-hour trip, uh, and, and I, would, I would find myself as I was driving along uh, concentrating on scriptures. And I would, I would even catch myself sometime expounding on those scriptures and, and even preaching. And yeah. uh, the burden became such a, such a regular thing with me that uh, I eventually, eventually talked with my wife and told her what was going on. I said, baby, I, I think the Lord has called me into the ministry. All and, right. uh, you know, I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure. <laughs> I, yeah, well, I, don't, I don't want you to pray over this thing. I'm just telling you what might happen. And um, so uh, it, it just continued all that summer. And, and then as I prayed about it, meditated on the Lord, I, I had a surrendered heart. And, and I, felt, I felt better. Having, after having uh, surrendered to that. My, my definition of, of surrender, and I tell our church, is that that's when you go ahead and do what you didn't want to do, right. and you take satisfaction in that. Wow. And, and so I, I, uh, I, that was pretty much my experience. It wasn't like a lightning bolt experience. It was just that the, the I don't even want to call it a burden, but for lack of a better term, it was just that kind of urge, a sense of urgency. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. You know, uh, we're living in uh, a, a pandemic times, historical times, uh, as uh, uh, they, they say that the last pandemic of this nature was 1920, sometime with the Spanish flu. Uh, and we're also dealing with racial un unrest. Uh, a two-part question, but the first part is, uh, how do you see this pandemic? Is this a punishment from God? Is this something that the devil's doing and God is allowing? Is this uh, uh, is this the uh, uh, part of uh, uh, the last days? Is this a warning to the church? A warning to the world? Any any thoughts on what this pandemic uh, is 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 all about? And and uh, please speak as much or as little as you want. Well, I, you know, I, I thought I started to say all of the above. All right. Uh, when, when you when you mentioned that, however, I don't I don't think necessarily that it is a specific punishment from God. I I, I get frustrated with people who blame God for things that that He may or may not be necessarily right. promoting. Um, you know, I think it was Elijah that talked, or Ezekiel talked about a storm, and he said God wasn't on that storm. He wasn't in every storm that right, is, right, uh, right. that comes about, and so. I, I, it bothers me that things go haywire in this world and we refer to it as an act of God. Right. And that's why people blame God for their cousins dying in a, in an yes. avalanche and 
or this this tornado comes and crushes the house and the babies die. That's act of God. Jesus. Um, you know, the flood comes and and ravages a community. That's an act of God, and we blame God for the. I had we had a, a, a my my van church van uh, three years ago. And as a matter of fact, we had a problem out here just the other day with a church van. But three years ago, our church van was sitting out in front of the church. And uh, it was on a Sunday evening. One of the members of the church lives across the street from from that. Uh, called me and said, Pastor, I heard this loud crash and a tree fell on the church, on the van. Oh, wow. Well, a tree fell on the church van and it was an older van. And so we didn't have uh, full coverage on it. Uh, I went to the city because the tree was on the city part of the sidewalk. And I went to the city and and uh, filed a uh, filed a complaint against them and, and an insurance claim. And uh, it, they wouldn't give it to us because they blame God. It's his God's fault. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was an act of God, they said, because rain had come. And so I said, yeah, you blame God for that. And you should have covered it. So I think what happens often is in, in pandemic situations, we, we do tend to look initially and see it's an act of God. I'm, I'm not in the, in the camp with a lot of people who are church people, faith walkers. Some people are inclined to say that you know this is something that you have to fight through because uh your faith will 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 save you your faith will make you whole and uh i i told our pastors in our district because I, we we actually have not gone back to our church yet and i've told them simply do not consider this a test of your faith but rather consider it a test of your immune system mm. and that's bottom line I yes, think some sir. carelessly, some people are, some pastors, some ministers are are treating this as a test of faith. And they're, they're, you know, the Bible says clearly, Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Right. I do believe that God is able to protect us and keep us. But I think sometimes the wisdom or lack thereof that we show is a, is a mark of our, our relationship with the, well, I shouldn't even say that. But uh, we shouldn't be so careless as to, right. uh, to, to flaunt uh, ourselves into this this uh, area that the adversary is using to to uh, to break up the uh, lives of, of individuals here. Right. Uh, my uh, my my belief is that we will get through this, but the carelessness of the people uh, will will stretch it out much longer than uh, that, than it should be. We've had people in our congregation who have been uh, tested positive and some been quarantined. But we haven't had our services yet, but on their jobs, they've had exposures. Sure, sure. Various things. Uh, we've had some of our leaders and families have died uh, as a result of COVID-19. Uh, I'm not ready to say those people died because their faith was was. No, I'm not no, prepared to say that. No, people die. You know, we just have to be careful. And so uh, is it the sign of the times, the end times? I think yes, but I think we've been in the end times. Since I've been since I've been living, uh, the thing is that you know God's time is is different from our time. Right, right. Uh, I, I think that we are in in the in the last days. I just don't know how long a day lasts with the Lord. Right, right. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. The uh, the the whole country and perhaps the world is now dealing with uh, racial unrest. It, it, we're dealing with the same things that perhaps our forefathers dealt with as well. Um, what is the answer of the church? Is this something that uh, we sit on the uh, sideline and say, we're praying for you? Is this something that we get involved in? Is this no business of the church? Is this the business of the church? What, 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 what is your view on, on all the things that are going on? What should be the role of the church uh, or more importantly, or at least in my mind, the Apostolic Church, the Pentecostal Church. Uh, we, what, what do you see our role at? That, that's an uh, that's a, an outstanding question. Uh, w when I was teaching in the classroom, I was my, my my methodologies of teaching was that I would try to get kids to ask questions because I felt like they would learn more if they asked their own questions, and I I would tell them that I'm, I'm looking for an excellent question. <laughs> and uh, so every question they'd ask, I said, that's, that's, that's an outstanding question. It's a good question. <laughs> so they would keep I trying to keep working. Yeah, I think they'd work, work, yeah, think work, harder, work at it. Harder. So <laughs> that, was <an> outst <laughs> that was an outstanding question, Dr. Cummings. Um, but I, uh, I, I think that, and seriously, it's a great question. I think that the church um, in, in this time 
if the church remains silent, then we have not lived up to our responsibility as mm. leaders. Uh, we can't just allow, I don't think Jesus would have been silent on this. I agree. I don't, yeah, I think Jesus would have spoken out. Obviously, he did speak out. He did. Uh, uh, you know, when he saw injustice. And I think that when we see injustice as leaders, we have to, we have to address it. We have to uh, point it out. And we, but, but it's not just about complaining. I hear a lot of complaints. Right. I think the thing is we have to, we have to acknowledge that the truth is the truth. We have to point the truth out, but we need to try to come up with some kind of, of strategies to where we can remedy these things. I think pointing people to the, what is right as far as Christian life is concerned. Uh, the Hebrew writer said, there's a verse of scripture in Hebrews chapter 10 that I really, it, it, I, I love that verse of scripture and, and it, it, uh, it resonates with me. I try to keep that in the forefront of mind. It says, uh, the writer said, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Hallelujah. Uh, that, that's, that, that's a strong passage of scripture that, you know, we, have, we know how to provoke people to anger. You know, we know mm. what to push, but the writer of the Hebrew epistle said, let's provoke people to love, provoke people to do things. You, you have to push the right buttons to make people do the right thing, make them have love, make them show good works. And I think that's the role of the church. We need to pull people together. We need to have dialogue. We need to inter, interact and, and have interchanging conversations with people who are not. A lot of times, Doc, I don't know about you, but my 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 observation is we like to talk to ourselves. Well, wow. I say that what I say, I mean, we like to talk to people who say the same thing we say. Right. We, we have a tendency not to. I think we had this discussion before. We have a tendency not to to want to grab hold of, of opposing views because right. that right. doesn't make me comfortable. I need to listen to people whose right. views don't don't uh, they don't match up with mine and they need to listen to me. Right. Uh, somewhere, you know, there's this this area that we can come to solutions, I think. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I know my dad always told me uh, that he uh, he uh, uh, always made sure there was somebody on his board that he knew didn't like him. <laughs> and so he said uh, uh, yeah. they would always bring up whatever negative thought of what could go wrong. Now, he didn't tell me who the person was, but he, <laughs> <Didn't>, said, he, <laughs> he said there was always someone on the board that he could count on that was going to bring up the negative yeah. of what was yeah. going on. Uh, the last question, and you've been so great. Thank you so much, and we uh, look forward to hearing from you. And, and that is, this is a fantasy question. Uh, mm -hmm. If you could, uh, uh, after pastoring uh, almost 38 years now, if you could go back to when you first recognized your call to ministry or maybe even getting saved and you could, you know, back to the future type moment and go back and talk to yourself at the beginning, what would be the thing that you would think is the most important you need to share with yourself that, oh, I wish I would have known this in the beginning. Is there anything like that? Talk as much or as little about it as you like. Wow. I think that's that's another real good question. Uh, <laughs> outstanding. I, that's that's tough because uh, there are. Do you remember? And I think you would. But do you remember uh, before you were pastoring and you observed pastors and you said, "Boy, I wouldn't put up with that if I was a pastor." Right. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> I would, I would have never come out of my mouth if I had known what I know. Um, but uh, I think that if I were to give myself some advice, I would say be sure that you set realistic goals. Mm. And, uh, set those goals beyond where you can reach them, but don't set them too far uh, to where you can't. You'll never be able to grab them. Wow. Um, I think that there are some, some areas of my life early in my pastorate I was uh, harsher with some people that I think than I think I should have been, but uh, as a young pastor, I was probably trying to um, prove that I was in charge uh, sure. of immaturity. Um, you know, some things about dealing with people to try to understand myself. You know, I, I was right. really trying to understand people. I probably needed to try to understand myself more than uh, than I did, and the discipline to hear the voice of the Lord, to hear the voice of the Lord. And I think that would be something that I, I 
you know, you hear people talking about that. We'll follow the leading of the Lord. Right. But then we, you know, we all, we do our own thing. We, you sure. know, um, and I think to have that discipline, that would be something uh, probably that I would, uh, would counsel myself in those areas. Wow. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, we want to take this time to, uh, again, thank you for being with us and we would like to uh, turn it over to you. I'm going to put uh, my uh, mic on mute and uh, uh, we we're very honored to have with us Bishop Samuel Moore, uh, not only pastoring a great church there in uh, Huntington, West Virginia, not only a great legacy, but he's also the, the diocesan of the West Virginia East Tennessee uh, Council. And so without any further ado, we introduce to some and present to others uh, what we consider our friend, uh, Bishop uh, Samuel Moore. Sir? Thank you, Dr. Cummings, and I, again, want to congratulate you on 40 years of ministry, uh, pastoral ministry, not just ministry, but 40 years of pastoral ministry uh, in Wheeling, Astabula, and uh, Weirton, West Virginia. I didn't realize it had been 15 years uh, in Wheeling. I remember, and I want to share something from the Word of God, I think it will be familiar with you, but I remember, I think it was the first time that I came to minister in Wheeling. As a matter of fact, it was you that first introduced my ministry to the Ohio State Council. I remember... It seems to me there was a, um, a, a, a youth conference or mi young people's uh, men's. Co I don't remember what it yes, was. Yes, yes, it, it might have been the council we were holding. Council, then, right? Was it in, we, in, did, did you minister up in Ogilvy? No, it, I think it was Fairmont or some place. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think but, it was uh, a men's conference. You're right. Yes. Okay, yes, yes. okay. And then I came back another time for something that you had. Uh, and I, I appreciate that because I... Well, I'm you're not, one of our favorite speakers. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I, I know I'm not one of those people that people seek out. <laughs> you know? Yes, you are. Um, but um, that was a blessing. But the first time I came to Bethlehem Temple, I think it was the first time I came there, um, my sons and I were... were I, I had my two sons. They were very young. <clears throat> had one of my sons, excuse me... Uh, he liked it. He was the youngest one. Liked to talk. He he talked all the way from from Huntington to to uh, I think it was maybe Parkersburg. He talked <laughs> <laughs> talked all the way, and uh, I said, you know, Harrison, you've been talking all the way. He said, okay, I'll be quiet. He was like <laughs> maybe seven, eight years old, and wow. he got quiet for two miles and talked the rest of the way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I remember well when we got because you would give me directions to the church. And I remember very well when we got there that uh, we, we came to the bridge and you gave yes. me the address was, what is it, Main Street? What is 330 it? Main Street. 330, 330 Main Street. Right. But when I got to the bridge, because your directions were come across the bridge through the tunnel and come back around. Right. When I got to the bridge, I saw it said Main Street. So I said, Cummins don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> So, so I knew it was Main Street. So I took off on the bridge. I took that Main Street that bridge before I got to the bridge. Right. And I drove and drove and drove and, and I got to. It's like I was going into an industrial kind of area, you know. You were, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I thought this is not right. So I stopped and I, I saw a man. Uh, I don't know if he was driving a truck or what. anyway. I flexed. I stopped someone and I told him where I was trying to go. And he said, I told him the address. He said, Oh no. He said, You, you're going the wrong way. But if you turn around and go back, you can get there from here. All right now. Yeah. So I, I started working on a sermon from that entitled, You Can Get There From Here. All right. Matter of fact, uh, what was that? was in the, in the 90s, I guess. Yeah, in, it in was. The, back in the 1900s. <laughs> it, was in the it was in the 90s. And, and I started writing a book. The title of the book was, You Can Get There From Here. Oh, wow. I and didn't that, know this. It, we, okay. Yeah. We can we can we can take our routes and we can follow the directions. We don't have to listen to the person that we, that knows the way. We can go the way that we think is the right way because the signs. Right. And and sometimes we get off track because we're following our own intuition. Wow, you're preaching so, already. And, and yeah. yeah, and 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 it was a great it was a great book uh, that you you know you you go and go and go, but just because you're going further and further away from the spot does not necessarily mean it's over. That if you wow. stop and turn around, you can get there from here. Glory, uh, glory. I, that book, that book, that was in the 1900s, and, and I had three pages finished. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I, one, of these, one of these days, 
<laughs> one of these days, I'm going to finish that book. You Maybe can the get there. Maybe the pandemic is long enough, you'll finish the book. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm going to credit Dr. Daryl Cummings oh. because he invited me and gave me the right directions, but I wouldn't listen. <laughs> I wouldn't listen to what he's saying. And that's oh, how people, you, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think that's how people will miss heaven. Is yeah. Because the directions are spelled out. The Lord says, this is what I want of you. Wow. But, uh, we, you know, there is a oh. way that seemeth right unto a man. Right. Uh, and we go and go and go. And, and if we if we turn around, we can't get there from here. I believe that that turning around is repentance. Yes. Um, you know, the Bible talks about the, the plan of repent, plan of salvation. The, the first step is repent, repent. And I think that a lot in a lot of cases, our uh, constituency, our people, our congregations, the people that we minister to, they have not quite repented. They they may have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Lord has been gracious to give us what we seek for and what we ask for. We we ask, he, he gives it. But a lot of people have not repented because I hear sometimes testimonies of people, rather than glorifying God for bringing them out, they glorify their ways that they were in. And, and that to me is not a repentant heart. So I think in Ephesians chapter 4, there is a beautiful uh, picture of repentance. And it, it says that uh, let, let him that stole steal no more but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good that he might have to give to those who need. So that's the picture of repentance, I think, that uh, that person who was ripping people off, stop doing that, let him and stole steal no more, but rather let him get, get a J-O-B. And then when you get your money, get paid, then you help someone who needs help. So rather than ripping folk off and, and taking and doing your thing, get a job, help someone else who needs. I think that's the picture of repentance, not just stop doing what you're doing. You know, the song we used to sing, things I used to do, I don't do no more. You're not doing anything now. Uh, places I used to go, I don't go no more. Where, where are you going now? You certainly don't go to church uh, on Bible class night. Uh, you know, things I used to say, I don't say no more in public, you know. So, you know, the, the picture of repentance is not just stop doing what you used to do, but stop that and then go in the other direction. And I think that is the, it, you, you can get there from here. You, you, you're going the wrong way. But if you turn around, you can get there from here. And so repentance is it. Uh, I want to share something. And I, I, I've been told that, you know, about the, the limitation of time. And I don't, I was told I had a certain amount of time, but I didn't have to use all of it. So, <laughs> so um, I, I just want to share something that was in my spirit um, relative to, to this day uh, from the gospel according to Luke, I think. It's also in Mark chapter 4. Uh, but in, in Luke chapter 8, same story, and it's, it's familiar to most all of us. It is about the uh, sower and uh, how that the sower went out to sow his seed. But in the, uh, in the eighth chapter of the gospel, according to Luke, uh, the, the record, um, the sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed. Some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And, some fell upon rocks, and as soon as it sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up uh, with it and choked it out. And others fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit. Now, then the Lord goes on to explain something about this, this uh, seed. But in the 14th verse, it says, That which fell among thorns are they which, when they had heard the heard. Uh, uh, they had heard go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. That which was sown among thorns are those which heard and go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. And so I think this speaks to us today about the various conditions of the hearts of men. We know that story of how that it talks about uh, there are some people who will hear the word and they run with it and, and they don't get rooted and, and it's all uh, taken away eventually when, when the heat and the pressure is turned up. But this, this that is sown among thorns interests me because what it says is there's a choking. There's a choking with the cares of life. That's not necessarily sin. That's just things you had to care for because you live it. Uh, the Bible says, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, the sin and the weight. So the weight may not necessarily be sin, but you need to lay it aside. Uh, 
So there are things in our lives that we have to care for that if we're not careful, if we're not uh, prioritizing right, if we're not aware of how to compartmentalize, I should say, these cares of life, they will choke us out. These things that choke out the spirit, these things that choke out the the fervor, these things that choke out the enthusiasm. In 40 years, I'm sure that the adversary would like to have had your ministry choked out, suffocated, these cares of life that that come our way, these things that will overwhelm us. It it can be family matters that that if we're not careful, they will suffocate us. They will choke out the uh, choke out the word and cause us to to be uh, lacking in those areas or not even to carry the words like Jeremiah said. He said, "I'm gonna sit right under this tree and uh, uh, I ain't gonna preach no more." And and I, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm just gonna die right here. I'm tired. The more I preach, the worse they get. They ain't listening to me. Uh, my my grandfather, uh, he he in his older years, he was very particular about time. And in his older years, I was told my cousin said he came to the church. He came to visit my grandfather and stayed with them. And my grandfather was preaching and he got to a certain point. And he looked at his watch. He said, well, it's about time to quit. I just said more than y'all going to do anyway. <laughs> so uh, sometimes the cares of life will cause us to just say, look, they, they, let them do let them do their own thing. Uh, employment or the lack thereof will, will sometimes suffocate our ministry. Uh, Sometimes it might be the bills that we have to pay. The car broke down on the way to church. My children are acting crazy. My, you know, the whole thing, all these cares of life, uh, they choke, they suffocate. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that in 15 years at Wheeling and the 20 some years that, or 15 years at Weirton and 20 some years at Wheeling and the 10 years at Astabula, uh, there were lots of things that the adversary would have used to suffocate you, to destroy you. But I'm reminded of Peter when Peter walked on water. And I'm going to conclude because I, I don't know when the time is running out. But I remember when Peter walked on water. That story fascinates me. It intrigues me. And I did not pick up on it for a long time. One aspect of it, the Bible says that when, when the storm came up, they were out there doing what the Lord told them to do, Dr. Cummings. The Lord told them to go out on the sea. And they did exactly what God told them to do. And a storm came up. Now, how does that yeah. work? You know, I'm trying to do what you told me to do, Lord. What, what, are, you, what are you doing to me? It seemed like you to make things plain. If I'd been disobedient, if I'd been like Jonah, now I could see the storm. But I'm doing what you told me to do, and the storm right. comes up. And so while that storm came up, the Bible says Jesus saw them where they were. He never took his eyes off them. He went to the mountain. They went out, but he saw them. He saw them toiling. The wind was contrary to them. And the Bible says this. It says, and when Peter saw Jesus walking on, he thought it was a he thought it was a ghost. He wasn't sure, and he he questioned. He said, "Lord, if that's you, because it was all fog and dark, dark and everything. I see an image out there. I'm not sure, but it, I believe that's the Lord coming after me. Hallelujah! I think Hallelujah. Looking, I think He sees me. I think, it, but Lord, if that's you, let me come out there where you are, which made no sense at all, because Peter's in the boat." The boat is a safer place than out on the water. Right. But Peter said, forget about this. I want to be where Jesus is. And the Bible says this. Said he got down out of the boat and walked on the water to go to Jesus. Mm. It, it wasn't about getting out of the boat. It wasn't about walking on the water. It was about going to Jesus. He was trying to get, and it doesn't matter what the barrier would have been, I believe, if Peter had had to walk on a bed of nails, he'd have walked on a bed of nails to go to Jesus. If he had had to walk on crushed glass, burning sands, whatever it was, he'd have done that because his motivation was not so much to do that, but to get to Jesus. Hallelujah. And when the devil saw him trying to get to Jesus, then he tried to kill him. Right. And that's what the devil has done to every ministry. That's what the devil has done to Daryl Cummings. He's in times past. He's tried to destroy him because every yeah. time you start to make a make this surge and souls are being blessed, souls are being saved. You're getting closer to Jesus. The devil said, I can't let that boy get. To he could if he let the devil thinking if I let Peter get to Jesus, he might stand and preach on the day of Pentecost. And three oh, thousand. Wow. I got to kill this boy right here. If I let him get to Jesus, he might walk down the street and, and soul and, and people be healed just by the. By the shadow that touched, and there's another test. I can't let him get. I gotta catch. I got to try to kill this boy. I gotta try to drown him. But the Bible says that Peter had the consciousness of mind to cry out, "Lord, save me!" Yeah. And Jesus heard him and lifted him up, and and that's the deliverer. And so every time we have a challenge, we have to understand that that challenge is not about us. When we start to go close to Jesus, the devil gets nervous. That's right. what it's all about. He's afraid of what you will become. I, I say often that 
when when uh, when the the devil tried to kill the Pharaoh tried to kill all the male Israelites in Egypt, he he started with two years old. He wasn't scared of two year olds. They, what's the two? That Pharaoh was not scared of them. Uh, two, what he was afraid of, not what they were, but what they could become. Woo! And God is not afraid of what you are. He's a, I mean, the, the devil, I beg your pardon, is not afraid of what you are. He's afraid of what your potential is. He's afraid of what you will become. And so he'll try Lord. to snuff it out then. Uh, you, you can get there from here. <laughs> you can't get there from here. I, I, it's such a pleasure for me to be here. I, I appreciate you inviting me. Oh, it was an honor. Oh, my God. Oh, what a powerful word. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I know it was an encouragement to me, and, and I believe uh, anybody who's viewing it would be an encouragement to them. We're going to ask you to come back with a closing prayer in just a moment. But while you catch your breath, I do want to uh, announce that our services for our tomorrow. Tomorrow will be our last uh, weekday uh, service, and uh, tomorrow our guest speaker will be none other than Bishop Charles Ellis, the former presiding oh. bishop. Of the Pentecost Assemblies of the World, the pastor of Greater Grace there in Detroit, Michigan. And then our grand finale will be this Sunday uh, at 6 p.m. And we're very honored uh, to have uh, Bishop Theodore Brooks, the uh, presiding bishop of the Pentecost Assemblies of the World, New Haven, Connecticut. He has honored us that he is going to conclude the services for us on Sunday afternoon. Do want you to know uh, we want to be a blessing to uh, Bishop Moore, and if you would like to be a blessing to the anniversary, uh, I want to encourage you that there are a number of ways you could support. You go to our Greater Love International uh, app. You can get it at the App Store, or, or you can go to uh, greaterloveministries.org or Bethlehem Apostolic Temple uh, .org website, or you can go to Giveify at Bethlehem Apostolic Temple, or you can also go to Cash App at dollar sign DWC Ministries, uh, capital D, capital W, capital C, uh, small uh, ministries. Uh, or you go to PayPal, Greater Love, or you can even text your offering at 304-451-9900. You can also donate by credit or debit card at 304-233-8899. If no answer, please leave a message. They will call you back. Or you can also mail a check to Bethlehem Temple, Post Office Box 6051, Wheeling, West Virginia, 26003. Uh, this uh, is a great anniversary. We've had great word. Of course, we don't get to get together. and We don't have to ha get those services where we receive those offerings. And so this is the only ones that we get. This may not be our best financially, but it is going to be our best spiritually, and we're excited about that. Uh, uh, Bishop Moore, you know, I, I count you as a, a, a friend, and we enjoy conversations uh, more than once. And uh, I'm, I'm honored uh, that you took time out of your schedule uh, to come and be with us. And I didn't think about it until you mentioned it, but uh, I think that uh, our fathers, who I believe both are up in heaven, uh, your father recently getting there, my father being there for the last uh, uh, 15, 10 or 12 years, uh, I, I think that they're sitting, I, I have a picture in my photo album of your father and my father sitting in front of our garage at our house in, <laughs> in, a, lot, in a lawn chairs and they were just drinking some lemonade or something and, oh. and talking, but they were, I don't know how long they were out there talking. Yeah. But, uh, they seem to be having a good time. And I would like to think, I, you know, I'm not trying to be uh, theological, but I would like to think that they're both up there now and perhaps looking at look at our sons talking uh, uh for the 40th anniversary i would yeah. i would like to think it at least put a smile on their face yeah. uh but uh, uh thank you so very much for your your time and uh please uh tell them how they can view your services uh i, I know you come on facebook and uh tell them how to view your services i don't know if you have a council coming up you want to tell them about that and uh and then if you would uh, give a closing prayer and any comments. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Cummings and, and Lady Cummings. My, my honor and, and appreciation to both of you. I appreciate you so much. I have a great deal of admiration for you uh, personally and some of the things that you have, some of the challenges that you've overcome inspire me. And I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, the, to, I mean, I, I, I look at you and I see your 
notoriety among politicians and and uh, other socialites and you know how to go in and out like solomon said i want to be able to go in and out among the people uh you know how to do that and still not use your lose your apostolic integrity and Thank so you. i appreciate i appreciate that uh, our services are we have our services at this point on sundays we're facebook live at full gospel assembly comma huntington full gospel assembly comma huntington and for the most part, we, we do our Zoom uh, Bible classes, but we push it out to Facebook as we're doing here this evening. So anyone who wants to uh, get in with us, go in and follow our, our Facebook page. Uh, you'll certainly be kicked into the group. Uh, if you'd like to contact us, it's our, we use the initials of our church, uh, Full Gospel Assembly, the initials FGA Outreach at AOL. Dot com. Yeah, we're still in the AOL. We got in on, <laughs> <laughs> on the ground. ground if it works, that. it works. <laughs> yeah, it works. So no use changing. Um, but it, it is a pleasure. And uh, thank God for the fellowship, the friendship. And uh, I appreciate it. maybe sometime we get to the convention, we'll be able to sit together. <laughs> <laughs> That's an inside joke. If, we, <laughs> if, we, if, we, if we make it back, maybe we can sit together yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. God bless you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are so thankful to you that we can call you Father. We appreciate your power. We appreciate your majesty. We appreciate your, your loving kindness. We appreciate everything about you. Every attribute of God has been a blessing to us. We thank you. Father, I pray blessing. I pronounce those blessings upon your servant, Dr. Darrell Cummings, that you would Lift him to places that he has not even imagined. That in his struggles, in his trying times, in his quiet times, when he's disappointed and frustrated about things not going the way that he would like for him to go, help him to see that you're God who has taken him to a special place. In spite of what's going on around him, you're lifting him, you have lifted him, you're encouraging him. Keep him strong, keep him faithful, keep him uh, wise to lead your people to the place of victory that you would have us to be. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Ghost, rest, rule, and abide with each of us, henceforth, now, and forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, and everybody that agrees with me in prayer, say amen. Amen. God right. bless you, Richard, and I look forward to talking to you again. You have yes, a sir. Thank you so much. Wife and family. I said praise the Lord. I will. God bless. God bless.